TD is now the world's most shorted banking stock. This is the headline that you probably saw on different social media and news outlet over the past few days. The question is, should you be worried about this if you invest in TD Bank stock, like myself? Hello everybody, it's Yashar here, back again with another video. And in this video, I'm quickly going over the history of shorting Canadian banks in recent years by various fund managers, including the 2019 short bet of Steve Eisman from Big Short against Canadian banks. I will show you what happened after these short attempts and then discuss the current challenges of TD. And finally, I will discuss whether or not you should be worried about these challenges. After 2008 financial crisis in the United States, failure of several banks and the success of short sellers during that time period, particularly Michael Berry and Steve Eisman, a lot of fund managers tried to repeat the experience by looking at various bank stocks around the world. Canadian banks were of course a prime candidate for shorting for some of these fund managers. I chose two examples of historical attempts to short Canadian banks. First is called the Great White Short, which was shorting Canadian banks in 2014. And the second one is a Steve Eisman Short on Royal Bank and CIBC in 2019. I will also look at after these events and report whether or not these attempts were successful. The most important fact to remember here is that shorting a stock, I mean betting on the stock price to go down in the short term, is of course a short term play in nature. It's like trading, it's based on one event at a specific point in time. And therefore, even if the bet on shorting a stock is successful, it doesn't mean the long term investors in the company are wrong. In fact, both short term traders and long term investors can make money on a single stock even if they bet on different price action directions. The short can bet the price goes down in the next two weeks, the long-term investor is betting the price is going up in the next five years, and both of them can make money. With that information in mind, let's look at the first example. Here I'm going to show you a short clip of an interview of Steve Eisman with Bloomberg, but Canadian banks. He was a part of Big Short in 2008, where he and Michael Berry bet against US housing market and made a lot of money. So he has a track record of predicting bubbles correctly in the past. In 2019, Steve Eisman went on record on Bloomberg and mentioned that he actually started a short position on three Canadian banks, including Royal Bank and CIBC. And he believes the Canadian banks are not prepared even for a normal credit cycle. And their share price will decline dramatically over 20%. I remember this interview caused a lot of panic in Canadian investment communities at the time. Now, let's look at his arguments. Say that the Canadian banks aren't prepared. How ill-prepared are they? Well, let's get to the other half of the thesis. So the Canadian banks, when they report, all report a capital ratio of around 11 to 12 percent. I believe the minimum requirement is 9.75. So on that basis, they look well capitalized. The problem is, and this, again, this is technical, so I, I apologize no, to your viewers know. for this. <laughs> but the way you capital, the way you calculate an 11 to 12 percent capital ratio is the numerator is capital, the denominator is not assets, it's risk weighted assets, and that means every asset on the balance sheet is multiplied by its risk weight. And most of the risk weights are created by the um, Canadian banks. So, mm -hmm. for example, um, Canadian banks assume almost no losses on their mortgage books, and therefore they have risk weights of 5 to 7 percent on their mortgage books, which seems to me absurdly low. My point is just that, look, Canadian banks are currently experiencing losses of 30 basis points. If you get a, a normal credit cycle, nothing catastrophic, just a simple normal credit cycle, those losses could easily go to 100 basis points. That's not a calamity, it's just a normal credit cycle. But what happens when losses go up is that risk weights go up. And my calculation is that you could see capital ratios, if losses go up to 100 basis points, capital ratios could deteriorate by about 200 basis points. So instead of being 11 to 12 percent capitalized, they'd be hmm. nine and a half to 10 and a half percent capitalized. All of a sudden, the Canadian banks would not be well capitalized anymore. So That's another, the other half yeah. of the thesis. 
If you want to watch the full interview, I will leave a link to his full interview with Bloomberg in the description box below. But Steve Eisman had a very valid and reasonable point in this interview. In summary, he wasn't angry with the bank's rating of risk for their mortgages and commercial loans, especially the negative loan loss provisions at RBC, CIBC and Laurentian banks. He mentioned that the capital ratios that these banks are reporting, I mean CET1 ratios, are just based on risk-weighted assets. This is 100% true. It means if the banks assess the risk of an investment and determine this is a low-risk investment, report higher capital ratios, while in reality they don't have enough capital to back up these loans. His idea was that these banks were not prepared for even a normal credit cycle and a soft or hard landing can easily destroy the earnings, balance sheet and profit margins of Canadian banks. This is a technical discussion. Uh, some I agree with some parts, I disagree with, in, uh, with other parts. Nothing wrong with, with, with these discussions, but this is another clip from his interview in which he clearly mentioned that he expects these banks to go down by over 20%. What kind of decline then would you expect to see, given the capital ratios where you expect to see them, what would that mean for the stock prices in terms of percentage declines? I'm not going to make that prediction. They'll go lower. You know, how much lower we'll see. But every time, but, like 20 uh, percent. I can tell you. I can just tell you. Or 30 or 40 or 50. Oh, if, look, look, um, 20 percent plus. That's about as much as I'll bet at this point. Okay. Okay. So Steve Eisman was pretty confident that the Canadian bank stocks, particularly Royal Bank and CIBC, will go down 20 percent, over 20 percent, at least 20 percent. Now let's look at what happened before and after a Steve Eisman interview. He explained his bets on Bloomberg on around April 9, 2019. So I guess he created his short position around the same time. So Royal Bank share price was around $104 at the time he stated this, uh, his short position in this interview. As you can see, for the next one year until pandemic, Royal Bank share price never dropped by 20%. Not even by more than 2%. In fact, it was basically up during this whole time. How about the other stock, CIBC? The stock price was about was around $54 when he started his short position, and it fell a little bit, maybe 7%, but then it recovered fast until pandemic, one year later. So to me, I guess Steve Eisman did not make any money on this trade, and probably he lost a lot of money over his short time bets against Canadian banks. I highly doubt that he held his short position for over a year on the banks as shorting a dividend paying stock like Canadian banks is really costly. He probably was not wrong on some of his points, but still it never materialized to be a 20% plus decline in the share price. And I don't think you can count pandemic crash as part of Steve Eisman thesis as every single stock was crashing during that time. Next, we have 2014 short bet against Canadian banks or the so-called great white short. These groups of shorts were making bets against Canadian banks based on high household debt levels in 2014. The main argument of these short sellers was that the household debt to income ratio of Canadians was sitting at a near record high of 160%. This was actually a very valid point again. It was a legit claim. This was so high and they predicted it it will result in a lot of defaults on the loans, which will in turn make the bank's earnings and balance sheet to crash. However, they also missed an important factor here. The debt to asset and debt to net worth of Canadians continued to improve during this time, this time period. And actually, it hits a new all-time low at the same time. So net, net debt was high, but also asset prices was high. They bet against Canadian banks in 2014, so almost here. And as you can see, Canadian banks went nowhere other than up from this point on. And all of these short sellers basically lost money in this bet. Philip Patterson, who is an analyst with IG Wealth Management, yesterday went on Bloomberg and discussed why he will not bet against TD Bank today. And he actually mentioned the great white short in his interview. So this is his words. About 10 years ago, we called it great white short, which turned into the video maker trade because everyone was shorting the Canadian banks thinking that, that there would be a repeat of what we saw in US. 
that never materialized and I don't think it will, he said. So after reviewing two short attempts on Canadian banks in recent history, now let's look at the current shorting bet against TD. First of all, I should mention that there are legit reasons why these fund managers are shorting TD. Like Steve Eisman in 2019 and 2014 great white shorts, there are some fundamental concerns here. The four main struggles of TD right now are first, their investment in Charles Schwab, which has of course high risk at this point. Second, their exposure to US banking system as they have a lot of branches and investments in US banking system. Next one, they are trying to buy First Horizon Bank, a regional bank in US, which we all know what is going on with regional banks and how customers are trying to pull their money out of these banks. And finally, Canadian real estate market, which some of these analysts predicts to predict that it, it will slow down significantly in the near future. So there are some legit reasons and legit claims. And I agree with some of these arguments. I think in the short term, TD Bank will have a difficult time navigating through their offer to acquire First Horizon Bank in US. And their investment in Charles Schwab is, of course, a risky investment at this point due to the financial distress of Schwab. I don't know what will happen in near future. TD share price may crash 20% or it can go up 20%. But what I know is that for a long-term investor like myself, this short-term fluctuation doesn't matter at all. Look at the history and see how Canadian banks, especially TD, navigated through various financial challenges. It was always successful. I don't think there is anything fundamentally wrong with TD at this point. Their investment in Schwab may have short-term effects on their share price and the balance sheet of TD, but in the long term, it's only a fraction of their assets. Their offer to acquire First Horizon Bank may or may not go through. I actually think TD may reconsider its offer or at least significantly change the terms of the offer, but even if it goes through at the current form and shape, it may put some pressure on TD balance sheet in the short term, but over the long term, they will be able to recoup the costs and make a profit. Canadian real estate market may have short-term slowdowns and troubles, but over the long term, it should be fine. We have, a we have a lot of immigrations every single year. We have limited supplies and we have strong regulations, which make it hard to believe a significant downturn and crash is coming to this sector of Canadian economy. Overall, if you're a trader with a short time frame, you should be worried about this news and short-term impacts of these challenges. But for a long-term in investor like myself, this is just an opportunity to buy more cheaper shares. Now, some people on the other end of the spectrum think this is an amazing opportunity for a short squeeze or stuffs like that, which is of course not true either. The overall short interest in TD, I think it's something less than 4% of the float at the moment, which means there would be no, there, there would not be a short squeeze like some people are saying over the internet. Overall, as a long-term investor in TD Bank, I would just ignore the noise, focus on the fundamentals of TD business, which all of these fundamentals are strong, and therefore I'm not worried and continue to buy more shares. I am currently heavily invested in Canadian banks. In fact, I have over $20,000 invested in two Canadian banks at the moment. I have over $10,000 in EQ Bank and $10,000 in TD Bank. And I will continue to hold all of my shares. There you are, guys. I hope you enjoyed the video and my coverage of recent short interests in TD Bank. If you enjoyed the video, consider subscribing to the channel to see similar videos. Remember that this video was not a financial advice for you to buy, hold, or sell your stock. And you always should do your own research before making any financial decision. Thank you for watching. And I hope to see you guys in the next video. Farewell.